What is going on everyone? This is Sarah coming at you from just outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And today we're going to be releasing the first of our three-part series looking at the 2021 MLB offseason. We're going to recap the offseason, recap the signings, recap the trades, team by team. Now this is going to be the first part. It's going to be the AL East and the NL East. So we're going to start with the AL East here. And it's just like the old, the other recaps that we've done. So we have the team and then we discuss the additions and the losses. So the first team will be the Baltimore Orioles. Now the Orioles are still in a state of rebuild. So they were never going to make a lot of moves this offseason. So they made a couple signings when they added second baseman shortstop Freddie Galvis and then a pair of minor league pitchers in Felix Hernandez and Matt Harvey. And then they did lose second baseman Hanser Alberto when they declined his option, surprisingly. So essentially, Alberto is one of those power hungry guys. He has a lower average good you know, good homers. Uh, Baltimore decided, you know what, let's get ourselves a shortstop that has, you know, a shortstop second baseman that's better at defense and Galvis. So depending on what you're looking for, it's a slight upgrade for what the Orioles run with Galvis compared to Alberto. Uh, and then, you know, they just, they're trying to buy low and hope that Felix Hernandez or Matt Harvey can develop and show what they were a few years back. Uh, swing for the fences, minor league deals. Can't hurt you. Best case, you get a couple, you get a prospect out of one of them. Worst case, just a couple of minor league deals that don't work out. Baltimore, in for a rebuild. Uh, probably going to finish last in this division again. But uh, Trey Mancini will be back soon. Should be back in time for the 2021 season. So that's going to help that team. Boston Red Sox. So Boston's another team that's going to be in a rough spot. So they made a couple moves. They acquired relief pitcher Adam Ock. Out of, out of you know, and outfielder Franchi Cordero via two separate trades. They also signed utility man Kike Hernandez and starting pitcher Garrett Richards. And then they did lose some players. They traded away outfielder Andrew Benatendi. He was the one that was traded for Franchi Cordero. They lost second baseman Jose Pereza via free agency. Longtime second baseman Dustin Pedroia announced his retirement not too long ago. And then Jackie Bradley Jr., a uh, key piece in their World Series winning team, is currently a unrestricted free agent. He's more likely than not not going to return to Boston, but that's why I have a question mark because he could return. So Boston's like Baltimore. They're in a rebuild. Boston always does this. They have a young farm system, though. They do have some good players that will be coming up soon. Namely, Jeter Downs will be the next big-name prospect for them to make his debut. So... Uh, Adovino is just kind of a guy that's going to help their bullpen a little bit. It was more of a salary dump for the Yankees to get rid of him. Well, Cordero's obviously a guy they're hoping can become a star player for their future. Losing Ben Attendee hurts a lot, but he was really, it was a good time to sell him. Uh, he's had two lackluster years, 2019 and 2020, so time to move on. And Pedroia hadn't played in years, so a lot of people, when he announced his retirement, thought, wait, Pedroia didn't retire a few years back? Nope. Uh, the case now is, will Pedroia be a Hall of Famer? That's probably a story for another day. Next, we have the Yankees, who, of course, are the Red Sox' biggest rivals. And they've, they've had a somewhat busy offseason, specifically with their pitching. So they signed free agent starting pitcher Corey Kluber. And then they had a couple of re-signings when they re-signed infielder DJ LeMahieu and outfielder Brett Gardner. And then they also traded for a starting pitcher Jameson Talon. From Pittsburgh. So they lost a couple of players as well. So they lost starting pitcher Jay Happ, starting pitcher James Paxton, and starting pitcher Mashiro Tanaka, and then they traded away relief pitcher Adam Adovino. So obviously this pitching staff's gonna look different. They're hoping some of their young guys can come up and make debut and have like win a spot in their rotation. They're obviously looking forward to the a couple of returns. Uh Domingo Herman should be coming back soon. It's Still questionable if he's going to have a starting job, though. So, we'll have to see. But it was always expected that Gardner and the Mayhew were going to come back to the Yankees. They're both key pieces. Talon's a solid pickup if he's healthy. Of course, this guy's coming off, I think, two Tommy John surgeries in his career now. So, we'll have to see. Corey Kluber, worth a shot. And then losing pitchers like Hap, Paxton, and uh, Tanaka. Life goes on. Hap's older at this point. He's not much of anything anymore. Uh, Tanaka actually went overseas, which was a little surprising. Yankees are still probably the front runners to win the AL East, though. But 
the Tampa Bay Rays aren't too far behind them. So Tampa Bay had a little bit of a surprising offseason. So they acquired starting pitcher Chris Archer, pitcher Rich Hill, catcher for Francisco Mejia via trade, and minor league pitcher Luis Patino via trade. Now they did lose starting pitcher Charlie Morton, and they did trade away at two more pitchers in starting pitcher Billy Snell and relief pitcher Jose Alvarado in two separate trades. So basically getting Archer back just completes the cycle and makes that Chris Archer trade that much funnier. It like seriously, Pittsburgh, seriously. I regress. I've already trashed that trade enough. Uh, Mejia is a solid backup catcher for this team. And then Panillo, P Patino will probably make the team, but he is still currently a minor league pitcher. He's more of a reliever though. So he could be a closer for this team in a couple years. And then losing Blake Snell is the big surprise. Nobody really saw them saying, hey, you know, Blake Snell, you're gone. But that's the problem with a small market team like Tampa Bay. They can't afford to keep all their good players. We're all going to be questioning that decision to pull him. But yeah. And then Alvarado just kind of had to go for them. Morton, good player. He was going to get, he got too much money for them to keep him. So the Rays are probably going to regress, but they're still a top three team in this division. I don't say number two because of the offseason that the Toronto Blue Jays had. So Toronto went out there and they made their names known. They acquired outfielder George Springer, relief pitcher could call him closer Kirby Yates, second baseman shortstop Marcus Simeon, and starting pitcher Steven Matz via trade. They did lose infielder Jonathan Villar, relief pitcher Ken Giles, starting pitcher Tawan Walker, starting pitcher Chase Anderson, and pitcher Sean Reed Foley via trade. So, essentially, Matz was acquired for Sean Reed Foley and another prospect. Uh, Sean Reed Foley used to be a top prospect for this team. He hasn't really developed into much, so I just wanted to mention him there. Matz, pretty similar thing. He wasn't that great in New York. He was, you know, for a while, people were saying, oh, this rotation's going to be amazing. Look at all the young players. Matz just never really panned out in New York. Toronto's taking a chance. Uh, the losses of them, they don't really hurt because, remember, Ked Giles wasn't going to play this year anyway. Getting Kirby Yates, he's a bit of a question mark health-wise, but if he's healthy, you're in a good position. Simeon, we'll see. He's going to be that starting second baseman. He's got some hope. He's got some potential. And then George Springer, of course, was arguably the best name in free agency. I would make that case because I'm not a fan of Trevor Bauer for different reasons, but... George Springer, very good signing for Toronto. I don't think anyone really saw Toronto as the favorites to get him, but it doesn't hurt them to have George Springer. That's for sure. George Springer, great addition for this team. So now we're going to go to the NL East. And the NL East is a little more, was a busy, had a busy offseason. So we'll start with the Atlanta Braves. And they started off, they re-signed outfielder Marcelo Zuna, Unfortunately, the DH will not be implemented in the NL for 2020, it looks like, so that does hurt him a little bit. And then they also got a pair of minor league contract third baseman in Jake Lamb and Pablo Sandoval. They did lose some players, though, in outfielder Adam Duvall, pitcher Felix Hernandez, relief pitcher Mark Melanson, and then we're unclear on if starting pitcher Cole Hamels or outfielder Nick Markakis are going to leave the team or if they're going to come back. Both are still pending free agents. Both are, of course, on the wrong side of 30. I, they're both on the wrong side of 35, I'm pretty sure. So um, Atlanta could definitely bring either back. But they tried to get some pitching help this past off, last offseason. They brought in Hernandez. They brought in Hamels. Neither really worked out. Hernandez just opted out of the season. He did, He never pitched a pitch for this team. And uh, Hamels just, he got hurt. He came back, and he only played a couple games. So... We'll see. Losing Marcakis and Duvall will hurt this team. Marcakis, though, still in flux. We'll see what happens with him. I think he's just kind of saying, you know, I'm going to wait for the right contract. Now, re-signing Ozuna helps this team. And then the minor league third baseman, you know, one of them will probably make this team. I prefer Jake Lamb over Pablo Sandoval, but that's me. Atlanta's still probably the front runners to win this division, though. Next, we have the Marlins. And the Marlins had a very quiet offseason. So they did sign outfielder Adam Duvall from the Braves, and they did lose relief pitcher Brandon Kinsler to the Phillies, ironically enough. So they really just stayed NL East. Uh, the Marlins had a surprising 2020 season. We know that. They looked good in 2020. They made the playoffs. They won their first round matchup against the Cubs. We'll have to see. This division's going to be tough. 
Uh, next, we have the New York Mets, and the Mets had a busy offseason. So they did sign catcher James McCann, and they also signed starting pitcher Tawan Walker. And then they made some trades, acquiring starting pitcher Joey Lucesi, uh, shortstop Francisco Lindor, and starting pitcher Carlos Carrasco. Of course, Lindor and Carrasco were bundled together. They did trade away Steven Matz, the starting pitcher, shortstop Edmed Rosario, infielder Andreas Jimenez, both were also traded away, catcher Wilson Ramos left the team, and starting pitcher, former Cy Young winner Rick Porcello is currently a free agent. He last played for the Mets, so we don't know what's going to happen with him. So the Mets had a busy offseason. They got a new owner. And Cohen's gone out there and he said, we're going to compete. This is this is our year. We want to get back to the World Series. So Lindor is an unrestricted free agent after this season. They haven't engaged in contract talks yet. So we'll have to see what happens with that. But Lindor is a great addition. Getting Carrasco as a, another piece was a great add-in for the Mets. Carrasco constantly underrated. Of course, we all know the story of how he beat cancer. Always inspiring. So we'll have to see. James McCann's a solid catcher. Not at this stage in his career. He's a little older, but they sent him to a bigger four-year deal. So, and then Walker, we'll see. Lucesi, we'll see. Now, the losses are going to hurt a little bit. Ahmed Rosario and Andres Jimenez are both key infielders. Jimenez has a higher potential. He didn't really show much in the majors last year. Rosario has always been like an average shortstop at best, maybe slightly below average. So getting Lindor really helps this team. We'll have to see. Of course, losing Porcello might hurt. Probably not, though. I mean, you got Carrasco. So next we have my Philadelphia Phillies. And the Phillies had a relatively surprising, weird offseason. So, of course, they did hire Dave Dabrowski to be the president of the team. So he's known for always aggressively trying to get these teams to the World Series. Originally, the Phillies were unsure if they were going to be spending a lot of money this offseason. They did manage to re-sign catcher J.T. Romuto and shortstop Didi Gregorius. And then they went out there and they did acquire pitchers in Chase, starting pitcher Chase Anderson and relief pitcher Archie Bradley. And they did trade for relief pitcher Jose Alvarado. Now they did lose starting pitcher Jake Arrieta and a pair of relievers in relief pitcher Brandon Workman and David Robertson. Robertson is a pending free agent, but realistically the only way I see the Phillies getting Robertson back is if he takes a veteran minimum deal no guaranteed money minor league deal and we all know that's not going to happen so yeah i just don't see robertson coming back to philly um uh, arietta wasn't great for the phillies so it's good riddance workman same exact thing the phillies are just trying to revamp their off season you know their bullpen um i could have mentioned brandon kittler here but i did not see his on a minor league deal so yeah archie bradley could slot in as a closer for the phillies we'll have to see he will probably have to fight for that role, though, with Hector Neris. He'll probably beat Hector Neris at some point. He'll be the closer. So, of course, the big signing there was JT Romuto and Didi Gregorius. Gregorius was always expected to come back to some extent. We all kind of knew, you know, Joe Girardi was his manager in New York. He loved Girardi. He had a great year in Philly. We all kind of knew he was going to come back. JT was the big question mark. We were hoping JT Romuto would come back. He did. He got a big contract. So... The Phillies have JT for five seasons now. It's an exciting acquisition for the Phillies. And if Sixto Sanchez develops into a star for Miami, at least you can say, you know what? JT Romuto is still with Philly. Lastly, we have the Washington Nationals. The Nationals had a bad 2020 season, especially for defending World Series champions. Now, they did make some moves. They signed relief pitcher Brad Hand, starting pitcher John Lester, outfielder Kyle Schwarber, and they traded for a first baseman Josh Bell. Now, they did lose outfielder Adam Eaton, infielder Howie Kendrick to retirement, and relief pitcher Sean Doolittle. So, Howie Kendrick was not exactly a superstar last year. He's a good player, don't get me wrong, but it was clear that he was coming near the end of his career. He did get a World Series ring with Washington, so it's always exciting. I, I do remember I watched him play in Philly one time. He stole a couple bases against Boston, so that was a good game. Doolittle was a key piece. But when they got Brad Hand, it was clear the rating was on the wall. Eaton, same thing. Good player, but c'est la vie. Like, he's done. He's gone. Brad Hand, good player. Brad Hand had a rough 2020 for the Cleveland MLB team. We'll have to see how he does in Washington. He's going from one of the weaker divisions to one of the best divisions. As Bryce Harper said, the NL East is the best division in baseball right now. That's debatable. Lester, he's done at this point, but he's a good one-year option. 
Josh Bell, though, is a big name that they got. I do like Kyle Schwarber, but I want to talk more about Josh Bell here. Bell had a horrible season last year. Pittsburgh had a horrible season last year. The future is bright for Josh Bell if he's in the right team. So he should be the starter for Washington. If this team can get their stuff together, Josh Bell is going to be a great acquisition and a great addition to this team. So I said before, I'm going to try to rank how I think the divisions are going to go. So the AL East is going to be close. I think the Yankees win this division. Toronto comes in second right behind them. I do see Toronto as a wild card team. Tampa Bay, uh, you can make a case for Tampa Bay making the wild card as well as, th as the fifth wild card team. I really do think Toronto has a good chance, though, depending on how much time they get. Uh, Tampa Bay could easily surpass Toronto, though. We've seen these free agent teams kind of fall apart. So right now, I do think the Yankees will win. Toronto second. Tampa Bay third. And then this gets a little tough. I do think Boston will eke out Baltimore for the fifth, for the fourth spot in the AL East. Just because they do have a few more players that you can trust. Rafael Devers, Sander Bogarts. If they make a trade to trade one of those two guys away, things change. But So I have the Yankees, Blue Jays, Rays, Red Sox, Orioles. And the AL East, as for the NL East... Uh, you can't go wrong with the Braves winning this division for another year in a row. Young, strong, talented team. They didn't do too, too much. They didn't lose much, but they didn't gain much. We'll have to see. Austin Riley hopefully can stand up for this team. Uh, I have to say the Mets will come in second. It's another thing, too, with team chemistry. We'll have to see how they can do. Uh, hopefully the Mets have a solid year. I do think they'll be a wild card team in the NL. I don't know if they'll be the four or the five, though. But the Mets have some, the Mets will probably be the five. So this will be a strong team to watch. I love the addition of Carrasco. Now, call me biased, but I do have the Phillies coming in third. I think the Phillies know the pressure's on them. They need to compete now. Otherwise, they're going to be gone. They're going to probably get blown up and start to rebuild again. I'm pretty sure Harper doesn't want that. So the pressure's on. I think they're going to be a slightly above 500 team. But with the NL being so strong and the NL East in particular being a strong division, I think they're just on the outside. I have the Marlins sitting right behind the Phillies. They could easily jump the Phillies. I just think the Marlins had a bit of a fluky 2020. I do think they're a good team. I know they're underrated, but I just I don't see the Marlins repeating a playoff run. And then last place, I have the Nationals. This is definitely a strong division if I have the Nationals finishing last, and I could easily make a case for four of these teams to finish in last place. Now, most likely, you could make a case for the Phillies. I know I'm going to get hate for that one, but... The Nationals, just to me, I think they looked completely lost in 2020. I don't know if that's going to linger. So for the NL East, I have the Braves winning, Mets in second, Phillies in third, Marlins in fourth, Nationals in last. Hope you guys enjoyed this. This was the offseason recap for the East Divisions in baseball. Have a good rest of your day.